My name is Don Mercer. In this video presentation, we will take a brief look at conducting a drying run. Financial support for production of this series of video presentations was provided by the Széchenyi Society, founders of the Hungarian programs at the University of Toronto. The Széchenyi Society sponsorship is gratefully acknowledged. I would personally like to thank Dr. Leventi Diashadi, professional engineer and fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, who is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Diashadi's considerable efforts in coordinating this project are greatly appreciated. The material in these video presentations is based on an e-book published in November of 2014. Its title is An Introduction to the Dehydration and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables. It is available on the International Union of Food Science and Technology website which can be accessed at www.iofost.org. We will begin with a short introduction followed by a look at the steps involved in conducting a drying run. Then we'll examine a case study of the drying of mangoes and finish up with some summary comments. Let's assume that we have prepared our materials for drying and that we know all about the factors that influence the drying process. Now we're ready to actually do some drying work. This is a rather general presentation that shows the basics of setting up a drying run to gather information about how a specific material behaves during a drying process. In the first step, we will set up the dryer to run at the proper temperature. 50 degrees to 55 degrees Celsius works very well. If it's adjustable, set the air flow rate on the dryer to around 0 0.5 meters per second. You should allow the dryer to reach steady state operation before going any further. Once the dryer has reached steady state operation, you can load it with the material to be dried. You need to be careful to get the even distribution of product on the dryer racks and make sure that the pieces are not touching or overlapping. You should monitor the conditions over the course of the drying process and if you're really into it, you can take observations of the temperatures and weights during the drying process. The third step is to test the material for doneness. If it is done, remove the material from the dryer and allow it to cool. Often the test for doneness is to take a piece of material from the dryer and bend it between your fingers. If it feels dry and has a leathery texture and you have not case hardened it, it should be reasonably dry and it should be considered to be done. In the fourth step you can package and store your dried material. It's best to store it in an airtight container in a cool dark location. So that's really all there is to it. But there can be more. Some of us really want to understand what is happening in a lot more detail than we have just discussed. So let's take a look at a typical drying run. In this exercise we will look at the drying of mangoes as a case study. Rather than getting involved in too much mathematical work, we will begin by following the weight of the mangoes from the time they are placed in the dryer until they are considered as being done. The mango slices have been placed in a laboratory scale dryer giving us the ability to follow the weight of the mangoes as they dry. And in this tray dryer, air enters through the grill work at the bottom left corner of the photograph and you can just see the orange blades of the fan inside the grill work. The fan blows the air across some heating coils and then it travels through the length of the orange dryer up to the point where you see the glass window. Inside the dryer at this point is the rack where the material will be placed for drying and you can see the balance located on top of the dryer for taking readings of the weights. 
So here are the mangoes at the start of the run. You will notice that they are just barely touching and you should look at the color and the texture of them as well as the size and the positioning on the dryer rack. Here are the same mangoes at the end of the run. Notice how they have shrunk in size, also they have curled up a bit and the color has changed considerably, although it is not objectionable. Some people like to remove the peel of things like apples and mangoes before drying them because when you dry them the peels can actually become quite tough and they may be unpleasant to consume. The temperature of the air in the dryer and the weight of the mangoes were recorded every minute for over 20 hours of this run. That gave us over 1,200 sets of observations. And it should be pointed out that when you are doing drying tests, you should actually be over drying the product so that you get the complete representation of how the material is behaving while being dried from the time it enters the dryer until the time the last bit of water is removed from it. Then you can use this curve to predict the drying times to reach a final target moisture that you would have in actual practice. We then took the results from every 15 minutes for the first 13 hours. That gave 53 sets of results and we worked with them. Here's the basic plot of the weight of the mango slices versus time. By adding some grid lines we can get a little bit more information from this graph. Here are some of the important things to note. The moisture content of the mangoes going into the drying run was 86.14% on a wet basis. The weight of the mangoes themselves was 240.9 grams, which allowed us to calculate the weight of the water. That was 240.9 grams times 86.14% moisture as a decimal fraction, and that works out to 207.5 grams of water. The weight of solids was equal to the initial weight of the sample, 240.9 grams, minus the 207.5 grams of water, which gave us 33.4 grams of solids. At a target moisture of 10%, we will have 90% solids, so the weight of the product at 10% moisture will be equal to 33.4 grams of solids divided by 0 0.9, which is equal to 37.1 grams. This last value, as well as the weight of the solids, enabled us to draw two lines on the graph, one for the weight of dry solids, which was 33.4 grams, and the other one for the weight of the product at 10% moisture, which is 37.1 grams. And here you can see how the weight of the mangoes during the drying process approached the weight of the dry solids, that being 33.4 grams which it would reach at approximately 14 hours. Now let's take a look at the constant rate drying period. This is something that may be difficult to determine exactly. However, we can draw a straight line beginning at time zero and following the curve through the linear portion. And you can see that by the solid red line here. So the constant rate drying period is actually the linear portion at the beginning of this graph and it appears to end after approximately 1.5 hours. We can calculate the rate of water loss during the constant rate drying period by taking the slope of that line that we just drew in the previous slide. So the slope of the solid red line is equal to the rise divided by the run and we've determined the rise as being 240 grams and the run as being 4.5 hours. This was done by taking two points on that red line. For convenience we have chosen the points where that red line crosses the vertical axis which is at 240 grams and also crosses the horizontal axis so that gives us a rise of 240 grams and that took four and a half hours, which is the value of the run. This gives us a rate of 53.3 grams of water 
being removed per hour and this is for the constant rate drying period. So the rate of water loss is 53.3 grams of water per hour. We can now calculate the rate of water loss in the falling rate drying period and for this we will do it at six hours. Here is the curve once again and we have drawn a tangent to the curve at six hours. This is indicated by the solid red line which extends from the far left of the graph to the bottom right of the graph. We can find two points on this solid red line which will allow us to get a rise which is 110 grams and a run which is 12.3 hours. So the slope of the solid red line will equal the rise over the run which is 110 grams divided by 12.3 hours which gives us 8.9 grams of water being removed on an hourly basis. And as indicated here, you can see that the rate of water loss is 8.9 grams of water per hour. And if we were to go along this curve and take the slope of the tangent at 8 hours or 10 hours, we would get even a lower rate of water loss since the curve is flattening out and becoming more horizontal as time goes on. Getting a bit fancier and using the dry basis moisture, we can determine a mathematical equation for the curve. So here we have grams of water per gram of dry solids plotted against time. We can then use the trend line feature of the spreadsheet program to get the equation for the curve as an exponential and determine the R squared value, which is the correlation coefficient. The closer the R squared value is to 1.000, the better the degree of fit between the predicted trend line and the actual data that were gathered. And here we can see that the R squared value of 0 0.9843 indicates that we have a very close fit between the trend line and the experimental data. The equation of the curve tells us that we can find the dry basis moisture, Y, at any time T by taking the initial moisture of 6.22 grams of water per gram of dry solids and multiplying that by E to the minus 0 0.335 times the time. So in summary, by using results from small scale controlled dryer runs, an in-depth understanding of the rate of water removal can be obtained. This knowledge can then be used in order to scale up the drying operation. This knowledge will also provide a basis from which to gauge processing improvements through such things as changes to the product configuration, the air temperature, and the air velocity. A method of developing a general model based on information similar to that presented here is shown in the video Mathematical Modeling. Thank you very much.